Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is such a lovely view to see, well, not many people, but at least to be in a webinar where we have quite a substantial number of MITS alumni attending. Um, so I should actually say welcome, good evening, good morning, because I'm quite sure many people who are otherwise not able to join us due to the fact that normally these events are in, in a physical kind of space prior to COVID now have the opportunity to join us for an online event. I'm Professor Engela Schlemmer, the Acting Head of School of the School of Law, and it is my big privilege today to welcome Ms. Mrs. Kate Hofmeyer to today's event. Um, she, I think, does not need much um, introduction because of the fact that she has been involved in the, um, the Zondo Commission for quite some time, so we have all met her, I would imagine, in our living rooms when we watch television or over the radio when we hear her as the evidence leader in the Zondo Commission. But just a little bit of background about um, Ms. Hoffmeyer, who is an advocate at the Johannesburg Bar. She is an old Vitsi, as you can imagine. Old, definitely not. When I look at her, she looks so very bright and young. Um, she did her BALLB plus an honors in philosophy at Vitsi. Thereafter, she did a BCL and an MPhil at the University of Oxford. She did, well, there's quite a number of accolades that one can add to her name, working at the Wits Law School as a part-time lecturer at the beginning, just after she graduated, winning the Jessup International Law Mood competition as a member of the Wits Law School team, also being awarded quite a number of prizes and scholarships worked at the, um, as a clerk for the Chief Justice of South Africa at the Constitutional Court in 2003, 2004, and then starting her career as an advocate at the Johannesburg Bar. And obviously, as we know, she's done wonderful work also in the pro bono organization, the bunch of things otherwise that she has done. And it is my privilege now to ask Kate Hoffmeyer to address us on commissions, law, and evidence. And I'm quite sure that you will be telling us quite a number of very interesting things and answer questions that we may all have, especially those of us who do not have a legal background and does not understand what commissions are all about and what is expected also of an evidence leader in such a commission. Um, Kate, it is my privilege. Please take the floor and address us. We're looking forward to listening to you. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Ingela. I appreciate that introduction. Um, it's not generally a good sign when you start a presentation like this with a caveat, uh, but this is an important one. And so I do unfortunately need to begin with it. The State Capture Commission's work is still underway. And so it is not possible for me this afternoon to present my views about any of its work or what its likely outcome will be. I hope that doesn't mean that many of you now disconnect from the webinar. <laughs> what I'm going to have to do is try to pitch my presentation uh, at a fairly abstract level, uh, rather than to go into the detail of any of the evidence that has been presented over the last, what is now almost three years at the commission. Uh, but I hope nonetheless to still be able to, to engage you on some topics of interest around commissions, law and evidence. I propose to do three main things in the course of this afternoon. I'd like to begin by looking at commissions of inquiry generally, and then with the unusual origins of the State Capture Commission in particular. I then propose to discuss what I'm going to call the machinery and mechanics of a commission. And then finally, I propose to look at the role of commission lawyers and how being a commission advocate is quite different to the normal brief that you receive as an advocate in adversarial circumstances. In South Africa, commissions of inquiry are established under the Commissions Act. Uh, the act itself is really something of an anachronism. It's an act with its, uh, vis uh, its origins in 1947. It refers to the governor general as having the power to establish a commission, and it refers to the imposition of fines not exceeding 50 or 100 pounds. 
And that's despite the fact that South Africa became a republic as far back as 1961. Despite being a relic of history, it is the act in terms of which commissions of inquiry are established in this country and in terms of which the State Capture Commission itself was established. It's also the act which vested that commission and others with powers to bring witnesses before it and to obtain documents relevant to its investigations. It is also the act that makes it an offence to hinder the work of a commission. The State Capture Commission, as I've indicated, was established under the Commissions Act, but pursuant to a process which, not to my knowledge, has ever been previously followed in the history of commissions in this country. Usually, commissions are established by the president or another head of state in response to an event or a circumstance of considerable public importance. If we look beyond our borders, one can think of the Grenfell Tower fire that broke out in London in 2017 and in which 72 people were killed. A year later, the then Prime Minister Theresa May established a commission of inquiry to investigate, and I quote, the facts of what happened at Grenfell Tower in order to take the necessary action to prevent a similar tragedy from happening again. In South Africa itself, we had the uh, unlawful, uh, un awful circumstances of the Marikana massacre in 2012, in which 34 miners were killed at the hands of the police services. That event prompted the establishment of a commission of inquiry. Those were both moments of great human tragedy in their societies. And there was a powerful need to establish how such unthinkable events could have occurred. One of the most important things to understand about commissions of inquiry is that the high watermark of their powers is recommendatory. They are established essentially to find out what happened. And then they are required to make recommendations about how to address what has happened and to prevent a recurrence. That fact about commissions of inquiry means two important things I want to su suggest this afternoon. The first is that there is genuine value, in my view, if a commission does its work with integrity, in a public investigation into what happened when events or circumstances of this nature occur. That process alone, finding out what happens, means that there will be a public record that will stand for all time as an account of an event or a situation of significant public importance. The second important thing is that because commissions are limited to making recommendations, such as recommending law reform or recommending prosecutions uh, be pursued or recommending policy change, those recommendations will need to be taken forward by the entities and functionaries to which they are addressed the legislature, if it's law reform, the prosecution service, if it's recommendations for prosecution, and government generally, if it's policy change that is recommended. And it's those institutions that need to take the recommendations forward in order for the full impact of a commission's work to be realized. Now that's commissions broadly uh, and in a nutshell. The State Capture Commission, by contrast, had some unusual origins. The State Capture Commission began with the work of an independent Chapter 9 institution, the Public Protector. And just before the former Public Protector, Ms. Madon Seller's term had come to an end, she managed to convey, conduct some investigative work into a topic that she called the State of Capture in South Africa but she had been unable to complete that investigative task. And she therefore issued a report which included a remedial order requiring the president to establish a commission of inquiry to continue what was essentially her work to begin with. Whether she had such a power to direct the president to establish a, a commission of inquiry was disputed by the former president. And the matter was therefore litigated in the courts the outcome of which was a court order 
requiring that the commission be established by the president. So in the end, the State Capture Commission was a commission which an independent chapter nine institution required to be established in terms of its remedial order and which the courts then had to direct the president to establish. In February, 2018, in accordance with that court order, former President Zuma established the State Capture Commission and issued its terms of reference. The terms of reference of the State Capture Commission are extraordinarily vast. And just to understand how all encompassing they are, it might be useful to just draw a contrast with the commissions that are highlighted at the beginning of the presentation. Commissions that are set up in the aftermath of an event like the Grenfell Tower fire or the Marikana massacre are essentially concerned with an incident uh, and may look before it to what led up to it and its consequences. But there's an event, an occasion, a situation that occurred that they then pour their investigative work into unpacking and uncovering. The State Capture Commission, by contrast, isn't concerned with a single event, a single circumstance. Um, and to give you just a flavor of the breadth of some of the topics that it's required to investigate, I, I, I give reference to term 1.4 of the terms of reference. It reads as follows. The commission is required to investigate whether the president or any member of the present or previous national executive, including deputy ministers or any public official or employee of a state owned entity breached or violated the constitution or any relevant ethical code or legislation by facilitating the unlawful award of tenders by state owned enterprises or any organ of state to benefit the Gupta family or any other family, individual or corporate entity doing business with government or any organ of state. This term of reference might, quite frankly, have read as follows. Investigate whether any public functionary has ever broken the law by facilitating unlawful procurement to the benefit of anyone. And that, I should remind you, is just one of nine terms of reference. So when people are amazed that the commission has been going on for as long as it has, they should probably spend a little bit of time reading those terms of reference and appreciating their expanse. The one other unusual feature of the State Capture Commission's origins is that the president did not, as is usually the case, appoint the chairperson of the commission. That task, because of a specific part of the public protector's remedial order, was given to the Chief Justice of South Africa. And pursuant to that process, Deputy Chief Justice Sondo was appointed to chair the commission. Despite taking a number of years and some litigation to establish the commission, I want to suggest to you that its establishment was actually the easy part. After its establishment, it had to begin to discharge that awesome mandate. And for that, it needed machinery. In order to discharge their mandate, commissions must be equipped to investigate and they must have an infrastructure to manage the administrative side of the functioning of the commission. But what does that really mean to have an administrative arm? Well, you need a secretariat to manage the extensive processing that is required on a daily basis. The issuing of summonses, the delivery of notices, the receipt of responses, the scheduling of evidence. The Constitutional Court gave a judgment in January of this year, dealing with the issue of the former president's decision not to answer questions at the commission. And in its judgment, the court referred to the fact that as at the end of 2020, the commission had issued 2,526 summonses. That task is an extraordinary one. You have to oversee the issue of each summons. You have to track the returns of service by the sheriff because there's a very particular way under the Commission's Act 
in which summonses have to be served. And you need then to track the responses. If they're out of time, you need to follow up. If a response is received, you have to make sure that it gets to the right person in the right team to consider the documents and then pursue possibly further requests for documents or, or uh, the need to then engage with witnesses as the investigation develops. In South Africa, we have no permanent infrastructure for secretarial assistance to commissions of inquiry. So each next time that a commission is established, it needs to start from scratch, employing personnel and designing processes. And those personnel and processes are absolutely critical to the proper functioning of a commission. And so they are not a nice to have, they're an essential feature of the work of a commission. I've often said to the teams of staff at the commission that the public gets a very limited and accordingly unrealistic view of what it takes to present evidence at a commission. They watch the evidence leader, the chair and a witness ask and answer questions over the course of the day. And it appears as those, those are the three people involved in the exercise. But what stands behind that evidence leader when they present evidence is thousands of hours of investigative work and a cons considerable commitment of the secretariat staff that have assisted in every letter that's been sent out, every summons that's been issued and every document that's been received. It's interesting to note that other countries have developed a different model to the one that we have. What they do is that there is often a permanent commission staff who are trained and equipped to run the process and administration of commissions. And then when a particular commission of inquiry is established, it can fit into that machinery, draw on its expertise, its tried and tested processing, and it can in a sense then hit the ground running. It does not need to spend its time staffing and developing processes from scratch. As I've indicated already, that is not a model that our law has adopted, but it's one which consideration may well in future be given to. I'd then like to look at another part of the machinery of a commission, and that is its investigative machinery. The investigative resources of a commission are different to its secretariat wing because the particular investigative skills that a given commission will require will depend substantially on its subject matter and its mandate. If you're a commission of inquiry investigating the collapse of a bridge, for example, you'll need investigators equipped with particular engineering skills. If you're looking at an instance of financial misconduct, you'll need investigators with particular financial and possibly accounting skills. You also need a good mix of investigative skills that cover the terrain of the subject matter. And you need a team to manage and oversee the work of the investigators so that they can interface with each other and with the evidence leaders of the commission and ensure that their work is complementary, consistent and suitably focused. At this point, I'm going to permit myself one personal comment about my work at the State Capture Commission. I had the considerable privilege of working with a team of four investigators from mid 2018 through to the end of 2020. They were without a doubt some of the most remarkable people I've worked with in my career. They came from a variety of backgrounds, different parts of the country, and between them they had forensic, criminal investigation and financial accounting skills. We met weekly for that two and a half years, and then daily in the lead up to evidence presentation. We had color coded Excel spreadsheets tracking every element of our investigations so that nothing would fall through the cracks. We were doggedly committed to doing our work to the best of our abilities. We laughed often, we cried on occasion. Well, actually it was only I who ever got teary eyed as I recall it, but we learned an extraordinary amount from each other. And it's no exaggeration to say that by the end of our two and a half years together, the investigators on my team were pointing us, the lawyers, to the areas of law that we needed to be considering. I'm sure that many of my colleagues on the legal team of the commission have had similar experiences. 
But what's important to appreciate is that each time any of us appeared at the hearings to present evidence, we were presenting the product of thousands of hours of tireless investigative work. But one might ask, how does that investigative work get done? And for that, we need to look at the mechanics of a commission. Our Commissions Act gives commissions of inquiry two important powers to assist in its investigative processes. Commissions have the power to compel witnesses to come and testify before them, and they are given the power to compel the production of documents. And I'd like to look at each of those mechanics. First, compelling testimony. A commission exercises that power by issuing a summons to a witness to attend on a particular day at a particular time to be questioned. Issuing a summons is an exercise of compulsion power that has implications for the rights of those who are summoned. It's therefore a power that should be exercised with care. When it is exercised, there is a penalty for non-compliance. If you fail to comply with a summons issued by a commission without sufficient cause, you commit an offence and you are liable on conviction to a fine or imprisonment. There are limits to that power though. When a witness appears to give evidence, they may refuse to answer a specific question on the basis that to do so will likely expose them to a criminal charge. That is known as the privilege against self-incrimination. And it's a privilege with the, which the Commissions Act recognizes may be invoked by witnesses summons to appear at commission. It's important to understand that that privilege against self-incrimination is different to the right to silence. The right to silence is a right that the constitution of our country gives to accused persons. It's a right in essence, not to give evidence at all not even to take the witness stand. And once it is claimed, no questions at all are asked of the witness, whether by their lawyer, well, witness in that case, the accused person, whether by their own lawyer or by the prosecution. Witnesses before a commission of inquiry are not accused persons. And so they cannot invoke the right to silence to refuse to answer any questions. What they can do, is in relation to a specific question. They can say that answering the question is likely to expose them to a criminal charge. And for that reason, they invoke the privilege against self-incrimination. You may ask at this point, well, but why? If you need witnesses to answer questions at a commission in order for it to discharge its mandate and find out what happened, then isn't the whole exercise one of futility if witnesses can just appear, invoke the privilege against self-incrimination and not answer questions? Well, I want to suggest to you that there are three answers to that question. The first is an answer that's already been provided by the Constitutional Court in its judgment of January this year that I referred to earlier. That was its judgment in the case dealing with former President Zuma's refusal to answer questions at the commission. What the Constitutional Court made clear in its judgment in January is that the privilege against self-incrimination is, quote, not there for the taking. It may not be claimed as a basis to refuse answering all questions. It may only be invoked in response to specific questions, and it must be properly invoked and not abused. When it is invoked, it should be motivated, and an explanation can be called for from a witness to explain why answering a particular question will likely expose them to a criminal charge. I'd like to explore that just for a moment, that notion of what types of questions give rise to a legitimate invocation of the privilege against self-incrimination. It's easy with some questions to see that the privilege can legitimately be invoked. Let's think of the question, did you steal the money? Well, it's quite obvious if a witness says, I'd like to invoke my privilege against self-incrimination, that that's the type of question, the answer to which could expose them to a criminal charge. 
But what about the seemingly innocuous question, is that your signature on this letter that I show you? That I want to suggest to you is also a question, the answer to which could legitimately involve the invocation of the privilege against self-incrimination. I'd like to explain why, but it really does depend on context. You see, if part of where that question is going, and if part of what is being investigated by a commission is, for example, whether the uh, crime of fraud was committed, well, then one knows that the crime of fraud con is constituted by the unlawful and intentional making of a misrepresentation which causes actual or potential prejudice to another. So when the witness is asked, is this your signature on the letter? If the alleged misrepresentation appears in that very letter, then answering that question affirmatively could potentially lead to a criminal charge against the person concerned. And so even that seemingly banal or innocuous question, is that your signature on a letter? I'd like to suggest is a question which in respect of which the privilege against self-incrimination can legitimately be invoked. But of course, as the Constitutional Court has told us, there must be a motivation if a motivation is called for. The second reason why the privilege need not undermine the work of a commission is that even if a witness is entitled to invoke the privilege, there is still a utility in asking them publicly to respond to allegations made against them. A public inquiry, in fact, provides those against whom uh, implications of criminal and other untoward conduct have been made an opportunity to set the record straight. The questions must therefore in fairness to any witness be asked, and the witness will then have to weigh carefully whether to give their side of the story or to invoke the privilege against self-incrimination and to not give an answer. If there are serious allegations against a witness, a commission is mandated to offer that person an opportunity to tell their side of the story. And so there is utility even in just the asking of the questions, irrespective of what response may be forthcoming. Thirdly, I'd like to suggest this afternoon that if on balance there are concerns about the fact of the availability of the privilege against self-incrimination being able to undermine the truth-seeking function of a commission like the State Capture Commission or any other, then it could really be for, par for Parliament to look at amending our Commissions Act. I mentioned at the outset that it's a 1947 statute. It has not, like many other uh, statutes on our statute books, been updated to strike the balance between the quest for truth, which is often the outcome of an inquiry process on the one hand, as compared with a witness's interest in not incriminating themselves on the other. We have a number of examples of laws in our country that have been updated to strike that balance differently. What they do, a ready example is the old uh, Companies Act, Section 417, in terms of which uh, inquiries into insolvent companies are still conducted today. The balance that's struck there is that with all witnesses are required to answer questions, even when their answers may be self-incriminating. But then what the law does is it provides that the evidence that they give in the inquiry cannot be used against them in subsequent legal proceedings, other than for a few exceptions, such as the crime of perjury. The Constitutional Court in a series of decisions has indicated that that type of balance being struck in that way is constitutionally consistent. And so if it were to be the case that in future commissions of inquiry were, were being undermined or, or disrupted in their efforts to discharge their investigative mandate, that is an option that would be open to the legislature to change the balance 
to not permit the invocation of the privilege, to require questions rather to be answered, but then to create what is called a use immunity against the use of those answers in subsequent criminal proceedings. I indicated at the beginning of this discussion of the mechanics of a commission, that there were two ways in which the commission can go about its investigative work. The yeah. first is summonsing witnesses, which we've been looking at. And the second is procuring documents. And I'd like to spend just a bit of time on that aspect. The Commissions Act empowers commissions to issue summonses for the production of documents. And those summonses are issued to people uh, or entities whom uh, it is believed would have in their possession or under their control documents relevant to the mandate of the commission. Those document summonses can be used in two ways to aid a commission in its work. The first and obvious way is that they're used to get documents that contain useful and relevant information before the commission. The second way in which they can be used is a, is a manner which is often overlooked. Summonses can sometimes be just as, if not more useful when they don't produce documents. And I'd like to explain why that is so. When a person receives a summons, they're required to produce the summons documents or to depose to an affidavit explaining why they can't be produced. Now that type of tool can be a very useful um, key to an approach to evidence being planned by an evidence leader. Because if a summons for documents is issued to a person who will subsequently testify before a commission and they are asked to produce documents, if they are unable to produce those documents, they're then required to go on oath, provide an affidavit and explain why the documents can't be produced. And that answer under oath, saying that the documents don't exist or explaining why they can't be produced, can sometimes be useful in the later questioning of the witness. An evidence leader plans the sequencing and direction of questions for a witness in order to follow a logical pattern based on the information before the commission. And there may be points in the development of that story and the questioning of a witness where a witness may be inclined to rely on the existence of documents in order to justify a particular uh, conduct or, or role that they played. Let's take, for example, an allegation that a series of transactions were not genuine payments for work done, but were alleged to be bribes paid in order to secure government work. In response to that type of questioning about the legitimacy of those transactions, a witness may be inclined to give an answer that indicates that they were legitimate transactions and that there are a whole host of documents which can be found and which uh, will show that because there'll be documents evidencing the services rendered and the invoices that, they were, that were generated pursuant to those services being rendered. But if those witnesses have already been summoned for those very documents, which are now being referred to in evidence, and if they haven't been able to produce them, then those witnesses can legitimately be asked about why they previously stated under oath that they could not produce the documents. One of the ways in which flushing out whether transactions are genuine are to ask for the documents, which ordinary business dealings suggest are generated when genuine services are being rendered. It's not always a fail safe method because sometimes documents can be created uh, to make it look as though there were genuine dealings going on. But it's at least a starting point to have begun the process of investigation, searching for the documents that might underpin transactions or dealings and show either an indication of their legitimacy or the contrary. Once investigators and the evidence leaders get the documents that they've summoned, it's then up to them to pore over the documents, to see where they lead. They usually lead to other documents or further engagements with witnesses that need to take place. But slowly, bit by bit, you start to unpack what was going on and you start to see how the pieces of the puzzle fit together. The last topic I'd like to address this afternoon is the role of an evidence leader in a commission. 
because it is a somewhat unusual role. Advocates are accustomed to being briefed to win cases for their clients. They are always bound by the ethical rules of the profession, but within those constraints, their duty is to their clients and to present the best case in their interests. A commission advocate or evidence leader, as we've become known in the State Capture Commission, has a different role. Your brief is not to win anything, but rather to aid the commission in its investigative work and to use the tools at your disposal to do so. I've already indicated what one of those tools are, the power of the summonsing of documents and how that can advance both your investigative work and your preparation for the questioning of witnesses. The second major tool at the disposal of a commission advocate is the ability to question witnesses. Wigmore, the doyen of evidence in the common law world, has described cross-examination as follows. Cross-examination is beyond doubt the greatest legal engine ever invented for the discovery of the truth. You can do anything with a bayonet except sit on it. A lawyer can do anything with cross-examination if he, I'd like to add, or she, is skillful enough not to impale his own cause upon it. Questioning witnesses by taking them painstakingly through the documents that the investigators have assembled and putting to them the versions of witnesses is the method by which a commission advocate assists the commission in uncovering the truth. The questioning of witnesses is another area where the role of a commission advocate is somewhat different to an advocate in their usual adversarial trials. One of the most important rules of cross-examination that you learn as an advocate, particularly in an adversarial context, is that you never ask a question of a witness to which you do not know the answer. Now that is a rule that a commission advocate cannot apply for a large portion of the questioning that uh, they conduct because their job is different. It's to get a story. It's to find out what happened. The commission advocate is not invested in the story being a particular way. So it's not about refraining from asking questions the answer to which could be bad for your case. You ask the questions because they're relevant to the mandate of the commission. And that will sometimes mean that you're asking questions to which you do not know the answer because you need to discover the truth as you go along. And that is particularly the case for a commission advocate where witnesses have refused to meet with you before they give evidence. There is no power under the Commission's Act to compel future witnesses to meet with the Commission or to engage with them before they are summoned to give evidence. And so in those situations where they have declined to meet with you, it is only through questioning under oath that you will often be able to unpack what they know and what they can tell the Commission. But your job is nonetheless to keep in mind at all times the full conspectus of the evidence that's been received from other witnesses and what the documents that have been gathered show so that you can put them to witnesses when their version is at odds with the version of other witnesses or when their version is at odds with what the documents say. That is an overwhelming task. Speaking for myself, it would never have been possible for me to question witnesses without the remarkable team of investigators supporting me every step of the way. And in addition, I had the help of junior advocates who were always allocated to my work streams and who assisted not only with the presentation of evidence themselves on occasion, but who commented on literally every set of questions I ever planned to put to a witness who researched areas of the law so that we would know what was legally relevant to the areas we were investigating and who were an immense source of moral support to me when the going got tough. Ultimately, a commission advocate must bear in mind that they are there to serve the public and doing so will not always be easy. There is a lot at stake for witnesses who come before a commission like the State Capture Commission. They are questioned in public 
about their involvement in matters that may constitute criminal conduct. And so it is for the commission advocate to have a very clear sense of what their duty is, to whom it is owed, and to be unwavering in their commitment to discharge it. Thank you all so much <laughs> for listening to me this afternoon. I think I did fairly well to keep within my allocated 40 minutes. Um, I understand that there's now a process whereby uh, questions can be put. Um, I have to just navigate uh, <laughs> some of them. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to go through the ones uh, that I can uh, legitimately answer. There might be some questions that I can see on the screen before me here that I can't. And so I am going to pass over those. Um, but let me begin with the first one, which is who chooses the evidence leaders. The evidence leaders are chosen by the chairperson of the commission. So that's quite an easy one. Um, there's an, the next question is, don't we have too many commissions which report on something, but we never, but never seem to do anything in response to their findings? Well, that was a point that I tried to highlight in the course of my presentation. You see, the commission is limited by its own powers and its powers are by their nature recommendatory. So yes, commissions of inquiry won't achieve the impact that they are potentially capable of achieving if those to whom the recommendations are made do not take matters forward. Um, let me just scroll through these if I may. Um, so I've been asked next whether the work of all the work of the Secretariat at the conclusion of a commission becomes available on the public record or is some of its privilege. Well, Privilege in that context is a difficult word to use. It has particular legal connotations. What can certainly be said about the public record is everything that is produced in the hearings of the commission would necessarily be a matter of public record. Um, that includes not only the testimony and so the transcripts of the question and answer sessions, but also those endless bundles of documents that are compiled and presented in the course of the hearings. Um, um, I'm just <laughs> quite a number of these questions that <laughs> I'm not uh, really in a position to answer. So it's taken me a bit of time just to go through them and decide which ones might be appropriate. Um, uh, this is quite an interesting question. Um, I've been asked for clarity on the question about invoking the privilege against self-incrimination and whether by motivating why you're not answering a question and citing the privilege, you might not be subjecting yourself to further scrutiny regarding that very thing that you've said in your motivation. I, I think that's a very good question. I mean, there is a little bit of a tension there. What the Constitutional Court, however, has made clear in its judgment of January this year is that there has to be some balance between the obvious abuse of the invocation of the privilege against self-incrimination, where there is simply no justifiable basis on which it can be invoked. And at the other end, it's legitimate invocation, uh, which I accept might require the witness to give some indication of uh, why the answer to the question might expose them to a criminal charge. But there is one important thing just to remember in that context. It's not a detail that I went into in the presentation, but it is an important point. When the regulations in terms of which the State Capture Commission were promulgated, there was actually a use immunity created under those regulations. So if you'll remember in my presentation, I spoke about how other statutes have actually struck the balance differently 
they've discarded the privilege against self-incrimination. They rather require that witnesses answer the questions put to them, and then they create an immunity against the use of those answers in subsequent proceedings. What happened in the case of the State Capture Commission is that the Commission's Act, which is the primary document, retains the privilege, and so it may be invoked by witnesses. But then when the regulations were promulgated, this issue of the use immunity was taken up, and there's a double protection as a result. Witnesses can both invoke the privilege against self-incrimination on the one hand, but then if they, for example, fail to do so unwittingly in the course of their evidence, or as this question has indicated, give some greater explanation in motivating the invocation of the privilege, such that those answers themselves might tend to be incriminating. Then they have the double protection of the regulations, which say any answer that's given, irrespective of the circumstance, can't be used in subsequent criminal proceedings against uh, the individual concern. I've again been asked about how one can ensure that the mandate of the commission uh, becomes something more than merely recommendatory. Well, uh, that's not a matter over which the commission has any control. Uh, it will be a matter for civil society, for uh, those who are invested in these matters to, to call people to account and to ask uh, what has been done in the face of the recommendations that have been made. Um, I've been asked when the commission will end. Well, it's uh, been given a, a further extension of three months, um, which will take it, I think, to the end of June this year. Uh, it might be another date in June, but it's certainly three months from March. Um, and I understand that that extension was sought on the basis that it's going to be for the purposes of preparing the report. Um, just have to see which <laughs> of these I can give a good answer to. Um, I've been asked whether the commission will be a catalyst for the amendment of our laws. The, the truth of that is that I don't know. I don't know what the recommendations of the commission are going to be. Uh, what I've tried to do this afternoon in the presentation is just speak as a lawyer, uh, looking at the Commission's Act, looking at how it compares with other legislation uh, in the rest of the world. Um, and there certainly are areas. I mean, just the reference to the governor general is something that should surely go and 50 or 100 pounds being the penalty for, for the commission of an offense should go. But there are also some of these quite interesting points about whether you retain the privilege to self-incrimination um, that may want to be considered. Also, the other uh, point that I made about an infrastructure, a secretariat infrastructure, which is a model that's been employed by other jurisdictions. Uh, that might be something that the legislature in due course wants to give consideration to. There are so many questions, <laughs> I'm just trying to see which might be most useful for me to deal with. Um, I've been asked uh, as an evidence leader whether I rehearse with uh, my juniors the level of questions that I want to ask and what the preparation is like. Um, Different advocates approach their task differently. Um, 
I've always believed that there's no alternative to good preparation. Um, I remember being told when I clerked for the former Chief Justice Arthur Chaskelson that when he prepared cross-examination uh, of witnesses, he would develop a, an extraordinary mind map of every question, its likely answer, the follow-up question, its likely answer, then you have to cater for an answer going one or the other way. Um, and that is a model which I've tried to follow. Um, and I certainly did engage extensively with uh, the lawyers and the investigators on my team to, to play out uh, different scenarios and to, to think about um, what the answers were likely to look like so that we could be adequately prepared for the evidence so that we could have done enough investigative work beforehand. Because you really, commissions do have a limited time available to them. Uh, and the idea is to be as prepared for that evidence when you have the opportunity to question a witness as possible. And so that sort of engagement and thinking around the issues and throwing out the questions and looking at the likely responses is one of the methods by which you can check yourself on your investigative work. How far has it gone? Does it need to go in another area? That sort of thing. I've been asked uh, how I keep my cool when I have a difficult witness. Uh, and the question asks, do I count to 10? I think on occasion I might have counted to 100. Oh, I've been asked whether I'm in favor of um, uh, the, the live streaming of the commission hearings. Um, I think the most important thing is that a commission of inquiry must take place in public. And if we have the technology available to us to make it instantly accessible to the public and to more people that, than those that have the means to bring themselves to the location where the commission is conducting its hearings, I think that that is generally in the interests of the public purpose, which really lies behind commissions of inquiry. Um, it does add to the pressure, though. Uh, I, I should be honest about that. It, it's quite something to know that uh, a considerable audience of people are watching every move every day in detail. Um, but on balance, I think it's essential to the public nature of commissions of inquiry that they are as accessible as possible to members of the public. Um, I've been asked who prepares the report of the commission. That's the task left to the chairperson. Um, and I think that's pretty much close to the time when I should be handing back to Heather. Um, so Heather, if I may do so, I, I'm sorry, I haven't had an opportunity to get to all the questions. Uh, it would have been lovely to do this in person. I'm, I'm realizing I only ever interface with people at the moment over platforms like this, but it is the reality in which we find ourselves. And it is, as I think uh, Ingla said at the introduction, an opportunity to, to reach a further audience. So thank you so much for the opportunity to do so this afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Heather Bangwayo. I'm the Senior Liaison Officer in the Alumni Relations Office. I'd like to just start off by saying a massive, massive thank you to Advocates um, Kate Hoffmeyer for today's event. I think today's webinar has been extremely insightful into a field that plays a really important role in any society's harmony and I suppose any, any society's harmony and stability. Kate, you have given us so much to think about and indeed left us with very valuable insight into an industry that affects each of us, whether it's as individuals, as organizations, and even as a nation. I think all the people that have been in today's event will agree um, that the Zondo Commission is something that we've all been hearing about almost daily in the media for a while now. So to have Kate come in and demystify it all has been truly fascinating. I certainly have learned a lot from today. 
And then with all that we've learned and relearned for those of us who are already in the legal, legal field, I do hope that you'll find this all very valuable because again, I always say this at the end of our webinars, one of the most important things for us at the Alumni Relations Office is to continuously provide you with information and resources that are useful for your continued development and learning. And today we hope you will take something away from what Kate has taught us and informed us of. I hope you, you will all be able to take away something that you'll muse on for the coming weeks and months, and then uh, maybe even taking away stuff that will be able to help you in any other way. I'd also like to thank Professor Engla Schlemmer for uh, the acting head of our School of Law for graciously affording us her time today. I know she was really busy. She actually had to dash off um, while Kate was still speaking. I know she was really busy. So thank you so much for making time for us today. Uh, we really appreciate it. Then lastly, but definitely not least, I'd like to thank everyone who made it to today's webinar. Uh, moving these events into an online platform has allowed more um, of our alumni to be able to connect with us in this way, more than what we were able to do uh, in terms of connecting when we used to have um, actual physical events at the VIT Club. We look forward to seeing you in our webinar for next month, which will be on the 22nd of April, and that will be with Pablo Fatide, is the CEO of Auric Business Accelerator. And this really promises to be an exciting one, so we really look forward to seeing you then. Until then, um, stay safe and good evening. <laughs>